குட் ஈவினிங் ஆஸ்பிரண்ட்ஸ் வெல்கம் டு த ஹிந்து நியூஸ் அனலிசிஸ் பை சங்கர் ஐஏஎஸ் அகாடமி ஃபார் த டேட் டுவெண்ட்டி செவன்த் ஆஃப் ஜூன் டுவெண்ட்டி டுவெண்ட்டி த்ரீ டிஸ்பிளேட் ஹியர் ஆர் த லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ஆர்டிகிள்ஸ் வி வில் பி கோயிங் த்ரூ டுடே நவ் லெட் ஸ்டார்ட் த டிஸ்கஷன் நவ் லெட் அஸ் டேக் அப் திஸ் நியூஸ் ஆர்டிகல் As per this news article, a constitution bench is scheduled to hear a list of four cases starting from July 12th. The Supreme Court is set to reopen on July 3rd after the summer break. The first week is dedicated to hearing miscellaneous cases. The focus of the article is on the first case that will be heard by the bench. This case revolves around the question of whether the state instrumentalities that is the government bodies or agencies have the authority to change the eligibility rule in the middle of a selection process for public employment. In this discussion, we will not get into the details of these cases. We will try to learn about the constitutional bench and how they are formed. First, let us understand what a constitution bench is. See, the Supreme Court is the highest judicial body in India. It has the responsibility of upholding the fundamental rights and liberties of citizens. So, whenever a matter of law arises and if it requires the interpretation of the provision of the constitution, or it involves a significant legal question then it may be decided by the bench consisting of minimum of 5 judges such a bench is called a constitution bench okay over the years the constitution bench have decided many significant cases for example in the case of menaka gandhi vs union of india the constitution bench expanded the scope of article 21 which relates to personal liberty Similarly in the case of Justice K S Puttasamy vs Union of India a nine judge bench recognized the right to privacy as guaranteed under the constitution these are some of the examples of cases decided by the constitution benches i hope you got an idea about constitution bench now when does the supreme court set up a constitution bench see according to article 145 clause 3 of the constitution a constitution bench must be formed when there is a substantial question of law regarding the interpretation of the constitution or it can be formed when a reference is made to the supreme court by the president additionally if conflicting judgments have been given by two or three judge benches or if a three judge bench questions the correctness of a previous judgment then the matter can be referred to a larger constitution bench note that the chief justice of india decides which cases will be heard by the constitution bench and he or she also determines the number of judges on the bench that is why the chief justice of india is called the master of the rooster also it is not mandatory for the chief justice to be part of the constitutional bench so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we covered the basics about constitutional bench now let us conclude this and take up the next news article Take a look at this article from the editorial page. This article is speaking about the Digital India Bill. Recently, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has proposed the Digital India Bill. The bill is aimed to replace India's 23-year-old Information Technology Act 2000. The ministry has been actively organizing consultations with different stakeholders on the proposed Digital India Bill. The main goal is to enact such a new law that it is to upgrade the current IT law to tackle emerging challenges like trust, safety and rights in the digital space. The Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has said that the first draft of the bill will be out by the end of June. This is the background. In this discussion we will learn about the important provisions of the Information Technology Act 2000. then we will see about the need for the new digital india act and finally we will also understand the things that must be kept in mind while framing the digital india act before getting into the discussion i have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion you can go through it now let us start with the information technology act of 2000 the information technology act was enacted in june 2000 and it came into force in 17th october 2000 In 1996 the United Nation Commission on International Trade Law has adopted the model law on e-commerce it was adopted to bring uniformity in the digital law in different countries further the United Nation General Assembly recommended that all countries must consider this model law before making changes or creating their own law so to give effect to the un recommendation and to manage the digital sector india passed the information technology act 
the it act applies to the whole of india the provision of the act shall also apply to any offence committed even outside the territorial jurisdiction of india and the provision also apply to any person irrespective of his nationality note that in order to attract the provisions of the it act an offence should involve a computer computer system or computer network located in india this is the basic information about the act now we will see some specific provisions of the it act 2000 firstly the act gives legal validity to electronic records and contracts and it also recognizes electronic signatures the section 2 subsection 1t of the act defines electronic records as any data image record or file that is sent through an electronic mode and section 2 subsection 1t a of the act says that any signature used to authenticate any electronic record that is in the form of digital signature is called an electronic signature so the it act 2000 only recognizes electronic records and electronic signatures secondly the it act provides for the appointment of a controller the main role of the controller is to certify the public keys related to electronic signatures apart from this the controller also lays down the rules and standards that has to be followed by certifying or signaturing authorities thirdly the it act provides for the establishment of a appellate tribunal the main task of the appellate tribunal is to hear all appeals from the decisions of the controller and other adjudicating officers note that the appeal from the tribunal can be heard in the high court fourthly the act terms certain acts as criminal offence the acts like hacking data data theft spreading of virus identity theft defamation pornography child pornography cyber terrorism and so on are termed as criminal offence under the it act 2000 the act also provides for punishment and fine for such offences fifthly the it act 2000 defines intermediaries like social media or, or uh, other digital platforms the act also vests some liability on such intermediaries see section 2 subsection 1 w of the act defines the term intermediary as one who receives transmits or store data of people on behalf of someone else apart from this the term intermediary also includes one who provides services like telecom search engines internet services online payment etc usually when the data stored by such intermediaries is misused they are held liable under the it act so the it act also takes into account the data managers and digital service providers in the country these are some of the important provisions of the it act 2000 now moving on we will see the need for the new digital india act see in 2000 the internet users in india were around 5.5 million but now around 850 million people in india are active internet users it includes individuals communities organization companies and so on so the 23 year old it act does not reflect the current reality of huge internet users furthermore in 2000 there were only certain intermediaries like internet providers but now there are multiple type of intermediaries like e-commerce giants digital media social media ai ott gaming etc so the current situation is totally different when compared with the situation in 2000 so a new digital law is needed to regulate such multiple intermediaries then in 2000s and all the internet was mostly used for good purpose like interacting and learning but right now illegal and criminal activities are being carried out with the help of internet apart from this a new complex form of threats like cyber stalking cyber trolling phishing etc are also harming the internet users the current it act does not explicitly cover all the significant problems so this situation advocates for the need of a new digital act in india now coming to the problems with the intermediaries as we saw earlier the current it act defines an intermediary as an entity between a user and the internet the it rules which were enacted subsequently under the it act sub classifies the intermediaries into three main categories they are social media intermediaries significant social media intermediaries and online gaming intermediaries here the social media intermediaries are platforms that facilitate communication and sharing of information between users and the social media intermediaries that have a very large user base are designated as significant social media intermediaries 
Here the problem is that the definition of SMIs is very broad. The definition of SMIs encompass a variety of services such as video communication, matrimonial website, email and even online comment section on website. The IT rules lay down stringent obligation for most intermediaries. The obligation include a 72 hour timeline to respond to the question of law enforcement agencies and resolving content takedown request of the agencies. Some well established intermediaries like Microsoft Teams and Zoho have a close to user base and there is a low risk of harm of information going viral. So treating these intermediaries like conventional social media platform will increase their cost of doing business and it discourages them to operate in India. So these are all the prevalent problems with the existing IT Act 2000 and the IT rules. Now let us understand the things that must be kept in mind while framing the Digital India Act. As technology evolves, the specific categories that the government defined today may not work in the future. Therefore, the government should keep in mind the fact of technology evolution while framing new digital laws. Apart from this, the government should need to set out obligations on intermediaries based on their ability and size. See, if the digital services is provided to a wide range of people, then the government must impose many obligations. But in case of small service providers like MSMEs, the government should try to impose minimal safety obligation. This would help the small service providers to serve the underserved and unserved people. In addition to this, the government should clearly differentiate between different types of intermediaries like communication service providers, close to user service providers, e-commerce, gaming, social media, etc. Including multiple types of intermediaries under one umbrella definition creates confusion and it also affects the effective functioning of some good intermediaries. So the government should also keep this in mind while framing the Digital India Act. Overall, a new digital law should be enacted to establish accountability and online safety while reducing legal obligation for a large number of intermediaries. It would create a regulatory environment which will help the government to achieve its policy goal of creating a safer internet ecosystem while also allowing businesses to thrive. That is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw the major provisions of IT Act 2000 and we saw why the IT Act 2000 must be replaced and relooked at. And finally, we saw what are the things that the government should have in mind while framing the new Digital India Act. Now with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. This news article is about a statement made by the general manager of the Bank of International Settlements. He said that even after the central banks all over the world have been increasing the policy interest rates for the past 18 months, inflation in most of the advanced economies is still high. So, to address the growing inflation, he called for further increase in interest rates. This is about the news article. In this context, in our discussion today, we will see some important points about Bank of International Settlements. The Bank of International Settlements or BIS is an international financial institution. It was established in 1930 and it is located in Basel, Switzerland. It is governed by a board elected by the 63 central banks with ownership stakes. The BIS has permanent seats reserved for the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy and Belgium. The BAS is often called the central bank for central banks because it provides banking services to other central banks. One interesting fact about BAS is that it is an international financial organization with for-profit operations. Now moving forward, we will see the functions of BAS. The first important function is facilitating cooperation. The BAS acts as a platform for central banks to collaborate and share information on monetary and financial matters. It promotes cooperation among central banks to ensure stability in the global financial system. Secondly, the BAS, as we already saw, acts as a bank for central banks. It provides banking services to central banks. These services include account for operating interest-bearing deposits and securities, gold and currency transactions, asset management services and provision of short-term collateralized zone. Here you have to note that the BES does not handle transaction 
or provide loan to governments it only deals with central banks it also does not do business with corporations or consumers this is the second important function thirdly the bas conducts research and analysis for important monetary and financial issues it publishes reports and studies to enhance understanding of economic and financial development then the bas contributes to the development of global financial standards and best practices it assists in establishing guidelines and framework for central banks it aims at promoting sound and efficient financial systems worldwide lastly the bas monitors and assesses risk to global financial stability it provides early warnings about potential vulnerabilities and helps central bank and policy makers address these risk through policy recommendation these are the important functions of bas or bank of international settlements so in this discussion we covered almost all the important points about this international financial organization now with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this article this text and context article talks about the recent wagner mutiny so in this news article discussion let us understand who are this wagner group what is the reason for their mutiny and its aftermath before getting into the discussion i have highlighted the syllabus regarding this discussion you can go through it first let us start with the question who are these wagner groups the wagner group first surfaced during russia's annexation of crimea in 2014 they are essentially a network of contractors that supply soldiers for hire that is they are basically mercenaries they have turned out to be an important security tool for russia in recent years due to the following reasons firstly the company has established a deep presence in africa's lawless region providing security to governments mines corporations etc so it allowed russia to expand its influence in the region without sending in regular russian troops secondly it has been involved in conflicts in latin america and middle east even in ukraine war they proved to be ruthlessly effective so being a private army they are stronger than the regular russian troops due to these advantages despite the legal prohibition of private military companies in russia the group got registered in 2022 and opened its headquarters in st petersburg russia now the issue started when the group along with its chiefs were deployed in the ukraine war the current head of the group is yevgeny prigozhin he staged a short lived mutiny after the country's defense establishment He staged a short-lived mutiny against the country's defense establishment on June 24, which led to an unprecedented internal security crisis in Russia. Now let us understand why did Mr. Prigozhin launched the mutiny. The crisis between Wagner chief and Russia's Ministry of Defense have been brewing for quite some time. Mr. Prigozhin accused the Ministry of Defense leadership of corruption and incompetence. even before this accusation both the wagner chief and russia's ministry of defense chief had disagreement during the month of february 2023 itself weeks after wagner captured a small salt mining town in donstek mr prigozhin said the ministry had limited supply of arms and ammunition for wagner which whose forces were on the front lines in bakhmut wagner captured bakhmut in late may but since they had limited supply of arms and ammunition they captured the city with one of the bloodiest battles according to prigozhin wagner lost some 20000 men in the battle which is five times more guys than that would have been supposed to have died following this mr prigozhin appeared in a video from the captured city and said that the ministry of defense leadership should be held responsible for their action but the actual crisis came out on june 10th when the defense minister sergey shaigo issued an order asking all armed volunteers to sign contracts with the ministry of defense before july 1st this order is actually an attempt to bring wagner's remaining 25000 forces under the defense ministry's command so the order is actually a threat to take mr prigozhin's base away from him this intensified the feud between the ministry of defense and wagner here feud means an angry and serious argument between two people or groups that continues over a long period of time now coming back 
Noticing all these development, Mr. Putin continued to remain silent, meaning he allowed Mr. Sergei to go ahead with his plan. So, on March 23, Mr. Prigozhin launched his rebellion. Mr. Prigozhin said Wagner would start a march of justice towards Moscow and they demanded changes of personnel in the Ministry of Defense by removing Defense Minister Sergei. Ultimately, the reason for the rebellion include Russia's poor battlefield performance, internal feud and corruption allegation. So, what was the response of Mr. Putin to the rebellion? While the crisis was unfolding, Mr. Putin appeared in the state TV. While addressing the nation, he called the mutiny betrayal and a stab in the back. But he was in a dilemma whether he should crush the rebellion using regular troops even if it leads to a civil war or find a face-saving exit. Mr. Putin chose the second option. He turned to Alexander Lukashenko, who is a long-term ally of Russia and the president of Belarus, to negotiate with Mr. Prigozhin. After negotiation, they finalized a deal and Mr. Prigozhin agreed to turn back. As per the deal, Mr. Prigozhin would relocate to Belarus and those Wagner members who did not join the mutiny would be allowed to sign contracts with the Ministry of Defense. The criminal case lodged by Russia's Federal Security Services against Mr. Prigozhin would also be dropped. But the key demand of Mr. Prigozhin to change the personnel in the Ministry of Defense was left unaddressed. This is about the aftermath of the rebellion. Now, let us see the impacts that is caused by the rebellion. The whole crisis posed several challenges. Firstly, Mr. Prigozhin set an example of challenging Russia's state institutions and walking away freely. This is something unusual in Mr. Putin's Russia and may leave implications in the future. Secondly, the whole incident exposed Mr. Putin's weakening authority. For example, after pledging to put an end to an uprising on television, what actually Mr. Putin did was speak to the mercenaries secretly and pardon them in exchange for their retreat. So, if the war continues without producing a tangible result, Mr. Putin may encounter further internal difficulties. This is about the drama that happened in Russia. Now, with this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. The news here is that the US government has given the green signal for manufacturing and selling of lab-grown chicken, that is, cell-cultivated chicken. In California, two companies named Good Meat and Upside Foods are producing this lab-grown chicken meat. In this context, let us learn about cell-cultivated chicken, its manufacturing process, its needs and the challenges that lies ahead. Before getting into our discussion, the syllabus relevant to this article is given here for your reference. You can have a glance at it. First, we will look at what cell cultivated chicken is and how it is manufactured. Normally, hens lay eggs and hatch them. From that egg, we get a new chick. But in case of cell cultivated chicken, a cell from a chicken is taken and it is artificially grown in a laboratory. In short, cell cultivated chicken means lab grown chicken meat for human consumption. Now let us see how it is manufactured. The manufacturing process begins with the separation of cells that make up the meat. Then the separated cells are placed in a suitable medium with resources which promote the growth and multiplication of the cells. Here the resources refers to the nutrients, fat and carbohydrates, amino acids and the right temperature. We consume food and from the food we get nutrients and we grow, right? The same thing happens here in the case of cell. The cells grow and multiply by using the resources and know that all these processes happen in a bioreactor. Here bioreactor is also known as a cultivator and it is a device with sensors which act as a container which has been designed to support a particular biological environment. After 2-3 to three weeks of this process, minced meat is produced. Then additives are added to the meat to improve its texture. Moving on, we will discuss about the need for cell cultivated chicken. Firstly, this process emits lesser amount of greenhouse gases when compared to conventional poultry farming. According to the FAO report, livestock is responsible for 14.5% of all the man-made greenhouse gas emission, within which poultry account for 8% of the emission. Lab-grown chicken meat can comparatively emit lesser amount of greenhouse gases. Then, the cell-cultivated chicken requires less amount of land when compared to traditional poultry method. According to a 2021 report, 
chickens that are cultivated in lab requires 63% lesser area when compared to traditional methods. Then, this self-cultivated chicken also deals with the ethical concerns of cruelty to animals. Many animal welfare organizations are against the cruelty to animals. Lab-grown meat can serve as a solution to this problem. Finally, this self-cultivated chicken can ensure the food safety as we can produce meat in large quantities to meet the demand of increasing population. With this knowledge, let us look at the challenges associated in promoting this self-cultivated chicken. The first and foremost issue is the acceptance by the consumer. The consumer may be reluctant to choose lab-grown meat just because they are not naturally grown. Even if they prefer, there will be an automatic comparison with respect to taste, texture and looks with original meat. So producers have to keep that in mind. Then the second issue is that the cost of production for self-cultivated chicken is expected to remain high even in the near future. So it cannot compete with the natural meat in economic terms. The third issue is the requirement of high quality cells and availability of suitable growth medium. The fourth issue is that there are many uncertainties surrounding the self-cultivated chicken. For example, a study by University of California has found that if lab-grown meat production requires a highly refined growth medium as used in pharma industry, then in the short term, impact of this method of meat production will be higher than natural method of beef production. But this paper is not peer-reviewed yet. Here peer review means review conducted by fellow researchers and scholars. So, since the paper is not peer reviewed, we cannot be sure about the findings of the paper. This is one example of uncertainty surrounding cell cultivated chicken. There are other uncertainties also. Let us wait and see the future of lab grown meats. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw what is cell cultivated chicken, how it is manufactured, its pros and the challenges associated with it. Now let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. See, this is an advertisement published by the MSME Department of Tamil Nadu Government to celebrate the International MSME Day. In this discussion, we will learn about the importance of MSME in the global economy and the importance of MSME sector in Indian economy. Firstly, what are MSMEs? MSMEs stand for Micro, Small and Medium Sized Enterprises. They are small businesses that operate on a relatively smaller scale compared to large corporations. In India, MSMEs are categorized based on two main factors. They are investment in plant, machinery or equipment and annual turnover. If a business invests up to 1 crore in machinery or equipment and generates an annual turnover of up to 5 crore, it falls under the category of micro enterprise. If a business invests between 1 crore and 10 crore in machinery or equipment and generates an annual turnover between 5 crore and 50 crore, it is considered a small enterprise. And lastly, if a business invests over 20 crore in equipment and generates an annual turnover between 50 and 250 crore, it falls into the medium enterprise category. According to the United Nations, MSME account for up to 90% of the businesses worldwide and these enterprises are responsible for employing over 60% to 70% of the global workforce. They offer job security to millions of people and give them financial independence to build a better future. In India, the story is not very different. MSME contributes nearly 30% to India's GDP. This makes them the vital part of our economic growth. They provide employment to over 110 million people in approximately 63 million enterprises. These small businesses manufacture a wide range of products from traditional goods to advanced technology items. In fact, they produce 45% of India's manufactured goods and contribute to over 50% of our total exports. However, it is important to note that MSMEs face challenges and require support to thrive in India. The first challenge is the issue of financial inclusion. Financial inclusion plays a crucial role in empowering these enterprises. For instance, many women-owned businesses face difficulties in accessing credit and financial services. This creates a financing gap and hinders their growth. So, by addressing these challenges, we can promote gender equality and empower vulnerable sections of our society. Then, MSMEs are essential for resilient supply chains. 
See, recently the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the global supply chain. Large corporations recovered quickly because they had the resources. But smaller businesses struggled to survive. So, by supporting and strengthening these supply chains, we can ensure the overall stability of MSMEs. Today, on the World MSME Day, the Ministry of MSME is celebrating Udyami Bharat MSME Day at Vignan Bhavan in New Delhi. The Ministry of MSME will launch various initiatives for growth and development of MSMEs such as Champions 2.0 portal and also mobile app for geotagging of cluster projects and technology centers. Champions 2.0 is an online platform that will provide extensive support and assistance to MSMEs. The portal will serve as a one-stop solution as it offers services such as mentoring, capacity building, access to finance and market linkages. So, on this special day, let us celebrate the achievements of MSMEs and acknowledge their invaluable contributions. With this note, let us end this discussion and take up the next news article. This is actually a sad piece of news. A five-year-old wild ass died at the Wonderful Zoological Park in Chennai due to complications in child delivery. May both the mother and the child rest in peace. This is about the news. In this context, let us see some facts about Indian wild ass. Let us start with its habitat and distribution. Indian wild ass is found primarily in the arid regions of India. Indian wild ass primarily inhabits the arid grasslands, saline deserts and shrublands of the Ranafkach region in the state of Gujarat. At one point of time, its range extended to the neighboring areas of Pakistan. But currently, this species is restricted to the Indian wild ass sanctuary. This species has adapted remarkably well to the arid surroundings demonstrating his resilience and survival skills in the challenging environment. The Indian wild ass has evolved various adaptations to cope with the harsh conditions of its habitat. It has strong hooves that enable it to move in the rugged terrains and the sandy soils of the grasslands. This animal is an agile and a swift runner capable of reaching speeds of up to 70 km per hour, making it one of the fastest land animals in India. Such exceptional speed allows it to evade predators and cover long distances in search of food and water. The wild ass primarily feeds on grasses, shrubs and vegetation found in the arid region. It has remarkable ability to conserve water, enabling it to survive in areas where water sources are scarce. The species is well adapted to extract moisture from its diet, reducing its reliance on external water source. Now moving forward, we will see the social structure and the reproduction pattern of the Indian wild ass. The Indian wild ass typically lives in small to large herds ranging from few individuals to over a hundred. Within these herds, there is a hierarchical structure with dominant males leading and protecting the group. These herds provide safety in numbers and enhances the chance of survival in the challenging environment. Breeding among the Indian wild asses occur year-round, although it peaks during the monsoon season. Females give birth to single foal after a gestation period of approximately 11 months. The young foals are born with protective coloration allowing it to blend in with the surrounding and evade predators. They quickly gain strength and coordination enabling it to keep up with the herd within a short period. Now we will see the threats faced by the Indian wild ass. The threats include habitat loss and fragmentation, poaching and illegal wildlife trade, illegal salt panning activities, invasive scurps in its habitat resulting in loss of food and in some areas uncontrolled grazing by the Maldari tribe has resulted in food shortages for the Indian wild ass. Due to this, the Indian wild ass is classified as near threatened in the IUCN red list and it is placed in appendix 1 in the sites classification. Finally, let us see the conservation efforts taken by the Indian government. One of the notable conservation efforts taken by the Indian government is the establishment of the wild ass sanctuary in the little run of Kutch in Gujarat. The sanctuary serves as a crucial stronghold of this species. In addition to this, the government has taken strict anti-poaching measures, community involvement and public awareness campaign to protect the Indian wild ass. Additionally, research initiatives are being conducted to better understand its behavior, population dynamics and the ecological requirements to aid in the formulation of effective conservation strategies. 
that is all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the indian oil dash in detail now let us conclude this and take up the practice prelims questions we have four practice prelims questions today let us see them one by one let us take up the first question this question is about bank of international settlements four statements are given we have to find how many of the given statements are correct let us take up the first statement it acts as a bank for central banks this statement is correct this we saw in the discussion now let us take up the second statement rbi is one of the 63 member central banks of the bis this statement is also correct rbi is one of the members of the bis okay moving on to the third statement its mission is to ensure monetary and financial stability through international cooperation this statement is also correct this we saw in the discussion okay moving on to the fourth statement basel norms are the international banking regulations issued by the bis see this statement is actually incorrect it is the basel committee on banking supervision which issues the basel norms and it is not the bis okay since three statements given here are correct the correct answer is option c only three moving on to the second question this is a previous year question from 2017 paper let me read out the question according to the wildlife protection act 1972 which of the following animals cannot be hunted by any person except under the provisions provided by law the animals given here are gharial indian wild ass wild buffalo see all the three animals given here are placed under schedule 1 of wildlife protection act 1972 so all the three animals cannot be hunted by any person except under some provision provided by law so the correct answer here is option d 1 2 1 3 moving on to the third question it is a two statement question about msme let us take up the first statement an msme with an investment limit of rupees 10 crore and an turnover of less than 50 crore will be called a small unit this statement is correct this we saw in the discussion itself moving on to the second statement there are no difference in criteria between services and manufacturing sector this statement is also correct according to the recent classification of msme there is no difference in classification between service and manufacturing sector since both the statements are correct the correct answer here is option c both 1 and 2 moving on to the last question this question is about our constitution bench discussion this is a quiz question for you interested aspirants can post the answer for this question in the comment section the main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here interested aspirants can write the answer for these questions also and post them in the comment section if you like today's discussion like comment and share it with your friends for more updates regarding upsc preparation subscribe to shankar ias academy's youtube channel and thank you for listening